Once upon a time, I wanted to be a bodybuilder, but then I realized that I should probably leave that to the people that are actually really good at it. So I've got Mr. Stan Efferding here on the Thank channel. You. Stan, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. I wanted to be a bodybuilder too. I, I, I barely made that happen at age 40. <laughs> so it's been a, a hell of a journey for me uh, since I started in 1986 <laughs> as a 140 pound college freshman. Uh, and learned a lot along the way, so I hope we can talk about what I think actually works and see if we can share why now in retrospect what the science says about it. Absolutely. So yeah. what we want to cover today is intermittent fasting and building muscle. Uh, if you're a veteran of my channel, you know that I am big on that, right? I understand how to articulate how fat adaptation works, how fasting works. But I have a little bit of muscle on me and people ask me all the time how I maintain that and I'm decent at explaining it, but someone that has really built a brand around helping people build muscle and get big that want to get bigger. Uh, he's the author of a wonderful book called The Vertical Diet, which we'll go into some detail here in a little bit. But Sam, I'm giving some quick background on you just so everyone knows your credibility. Yeah, skinny kid. I was, uh, you know, got to college again, 140 pounds. I wrestled 98 as a freshman and a sophomore <laughs> in high school. 106 as a junior, I weighed 115 as a senior. And uh, when I got to college, I really wanted to, I saw a magazine and I wanted to be a bodybuilder. And you can imagine uh, the, the, the feedback I got from folks at the time when you're six foot, um, the bodybuilders back then, it was everybody over 198 pounds, you need to be 250 plus yeah. of muscle. And so I embarked on this journey, um, much to the chagrin of all the doubters, of, of competing in bodybuilding. That's what I wanted to do more than anything. And so I started studying exercise science at the University of Oregon and uh, became a high school soccer coach and started working with the track and football teams there and all the while behind the scenes I had my passion, not a career, although I worked as a personal trainer uh, in, in college and thereafter, um, uh, I used most of that opportunity to train myself and to learn about the business. And so really it's been a lifetime passion competing in both bodybuilding and powerlifting because I thought getting stronger would make me bigger. We can talk about how that didn't quite um, doesn't quite meet up to the science yeah. today and, and how that might actually have, have uh, not benefited my, my progress. So uh, I just wanted to be a great bodybuilder. So over the course of the last 30 plus years of competing, I had to gain and lose, albeit intentionally, uh, in terms of getting as big as I could to compete in powerlifting and then as ripped as I could to compete in bodybuilding, well in excess of a thousand, probably 1,500 plus pounds. And I learned a lot of lessons along the way. Yeah. And we talked earlier about the fact that maybe now we're starting to see the science explain what I learned from personal experience, yeah. uh, a lot of mistakes, uh, and being able to help other people do uh, or achieve the things that I wanted to achieve. I would say if I knew then what I know now, yeah. with less, uh, um, I wouldn't want to say effort, but certainly, uh, you know, expediting the process yeah, without a doubt. and reaching their goals uh, without as much hard lessons over the years. No, definitely. And that's exactly what we were talking about before we started filming was, you know, sort of the mantra of this channel, which is pursue results and then reinforce with science, you know, be your own N equals one. I try a lot of things that work, a lot of things that don't work. And the idea is to then work backwards and figure out, okay, well, what is existing in the research already that could reinforce why this happened, why I had this outcome. And it's the kind of the world that Stan and I both live in. And I thought it was just a great marriage for both of us to come here and talk, whereas me, someone that is largely a low carb person, but with the implementation of carbohydrates and someone that is very much so pro carbohydrates and also wanted to be able to explain that there are a, is a way, excuse me, to marry both of those. So we'll kind of jump in. So with intermittent fasting, uh, you know, the idea is you can still absolutely build muscle. It's just a matter of switching things up. So I'll kind of break down what I do when I'm in a muscle building phase and kind of the, the entryway there with intermittent fasting and building muscle and then turn it to you to kind of explain the vertical approach mm -hmm. and how that could work really well. Because I do think that the book that you wrote really aligns perfectly with someone that is intermittent fasting. So first off, if you're building muscle, don't intermittent fast every day, okay? Intermittent fasting needs to be this like catalyst. It needs to be what is keeping you lean while you are putting on muscle. It needs to also be something that is used as a catalyst to keep you ultra insulin sensitive. Because make no mistake, if you're trying to build muscle, you need to be in a caloric surplus. But I think people have a tendency to look at caloric surplus and give it a freeze frame of being like a caloric surplus, 
uh, over 24 hours versus, okay, well, what about a caloric surplus over a 12 hour period or a caloric surplus over a one week period? You know, we still have to look at physics and thermodynamics and it doesn't just automatically have to be a 24 hour window. The clock doesn't reset at zero at midnight. Right. So that's kind of like my approach is you don't want to be fasting every single day, but then you still need to be able to leverage the insulin sensitivity that comes from a fast. So when you're fasting, you aren't eating, obviously. So what's happening is your cells are becoming much more sensitive to available glucose when it does come into play. Now, once you break a fast, sure, you have your protein, which we can get into specifics about, or I have other videos that break that down in more detail. But once you've broken your fast, then you still have X number of hours left of eating. Mm -hmm. And how you eat during that period is going to be a huge determining factor of how much muscle you put on because you absolutely still need to get the calories in during that period. So with that, explain kind of your philosophy. What's your approach there? There's a whole range. It, it exists on a continuum. The bigger the athlete with the larger workload, the more calories they're going to have to consume. That's Calories are king uh, in terms of being able to gain uh, or lose weight. Yeah. You got to be in a surplus or a deficit. Yep. There's just no way around it. Now, if you only need to consume 3,000 calories a day or 2,700 in order to maintain a surplus, you can easily do that in an intermittent fasting window. Yeah. Whether it be a 16-8 or what have you. It's Again, like you said, it's the 24-hour it's the total or maybe even better describe the weekly yeah. uh, uh, calorie surplus. Yeah. That's pretty easy to achieve. As the athletes get bigger and bigger, it becomes harder and harder to fit that many calories, just physically yes. speaking. Yeah. You know, it's the mechanical process yeah. of consuming that much food in such a short period of time. That's when it gets a little more challenging, but now we're talking about a really small percentage of people. For the vast majority of people that want to gain muscle and fast, uh, certainly uh, is going to be mostly uh, based on their ability to maintain a calorie surplus over the course of the day so they could do their 16-8. And then secondly, protein. And we used to think that you had to get, you know, six evenly spaced meals a day, to, yeah. you know, to have that protein, muscle protein synthesis. And you come to find out that whether it's two or six, it doesn't matter. If you yeah. equate for calories and protein intake, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I like to time those around the workout to take advantage yeah. of the, uh, the, the window, yeah. the anabolic window, which we've discovered is longer than we used to think. Exactly. Yeah. We used to think as soon as you got done training, you had to race over and pound a shake. And I used to do that when yeah, I was training too. the University of Oregon yeah. football players. I used to bring their drinks to the gym. I still do it now with John Jones. I'm training down in Albuquerque. Yeah. I bring his protein shake to the gym just because I can control yeah. that one feeding. I don't know what happens when you know people leave the gym. And so <laughs> that was the one thing that I could, you know, be able to be in control of. Are you getting sufficient protein? But we know that window is pretty broad. We know it's probably five hours yeah. uh, for that uh, important stimulus for that workout, yeah. that, a particular workout. And so that could happen with a meal maybe two hours before you train and then within two hours after you train. Yeah. That could be the entire amount of calories that you consume for the day uh, or the feedings, yeah. two feedings, which I, I, I like to I like to put them, I like to bookend them around the workout yeah. for a couple of reasons. And again, this is, now we're talking about a, a small percentage of the population that, that where performance is critical, yeah. meaning can they get one more rep? Can yeah. they do yeah. one more set? Um, you know, can they lift five more pounds? And that might happen better in a fed state yeah. for an athlete than in, uh, uh, in an unfed state. So I do like to feed them a couple hours before training, maybe three, two to three hours before training, depending on the intensity of the workout, and then within an hour thereafter. Yeah. And if they can satisfy their caloric demand and get sufficient protein, which we seem to think is generally around a gram of protein per pound of lean weight or goal weight. Most yeah. of my athletes I really shoot for, because they're already pretty lean, yeah. a gram of, of protein per pound of body weight. So that's, not, that's not extreme. <clears throat> it's not extreme. No. And there's no more than that's necessary. Yeah. And uh, that can be easily accomplished in two feedings. Uh, and stay within your 16-8 your window or whatever you choose. Yeah. And then, like you say, on the day off training, uh, you could just do a, a one feeding. Uh, and then you had some more in, input in terms of how do you refeed from a fast. Uh, and, and I obviously have a lot of experience in this as well because I've dieted uh, or, or I've done water cuts for athletes yeah. for yeah. many years mm -hmm. and have done it myself. Yep. In preparation for both bodybuilding and powerlifting, sometimes you have to cut weight to meet a certain weight yep. class. And when you do an extreme cut like that, 
which can take 48 to 72 hours of really depleting yourself. Yeah. Um, you cut out all your carbs, you cut out your sodium, you're depleting your water. When you refeed, a lot of guys, they'll run to IHOP. Yeah, and my, uh, the results from that is yeah. just massive uh, you know, indigestion and diarrhea. And they don't carb up sufficiently, yeah. as, as you're aware. Yeah. So we have a very strict protocol for refeeding, which is similar to what you've been talking about. We've got to get that, the enzymes back in and get the digestive system stimulated and use maybe some liquids initially, get their uh, hydration first, the sodium and potassium, yep. magnesium, those things become essential initially. The second you step off the scale, you're really setting your body up to be able to consume the calories that you need to consume Precisely. Uh, after you've positioned yourself to do that. And if you just go to IHOP and cram down a whole ton of food, it, 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 you're, you're a dead end. But if you do it logically and with a progression like anything else that you do in, uh, in, you know, with the, the, in the fitness industry, everything has to be done uh, according to a yeah. progression, then you can get extraordinary results in just a short period of time. I took Dan Green from 248 pounds down to 220 in 48 hours. Oh the water cut. It's not uncommon in the UFC to do similar kinds of things. Yeah. 248 down to 220 within 48 hours, and you prepare for that. You, know, you pull sodium, pull water, pull fiber, you know, yeah. do a little bit of exertion, some sweating. And you can make that scale weight over the next 24 hours, we got him up to 252 pounds on the platform when he set the 220 world record. He weighed 252 standing on the platform. So his performance was sufficient enough. If you try and do that to somebody incorrectly, they'll have a, they'll have a, a terrible performance deficit. Yeah. They won't be able to recover and get as strong or, or you know, in the case of fighters, even to have the cardiovascular yes. fitness necessary to perform there. That's such so a good point. It's kind yeah. of a lot of information, but it, it, it speaks to what's necessary for oh, that makes a broad so range much of sense. people. And today's video is sponsored by Seed. So if you are checking out a probiotic, definitely one that I recommend. So they are what is called a symbiotic, which means they have a prebiotic and a probiotic together. Really unique formula. In fact, they have a really unique setup where if you look at the capsule, there's a capsule inside of a capsule. So what that's doing is that's helping out with what's called colonization. So you're actually getting potentially the right staging of those bacteria. Because when you're talking about intermittent fasting, when you're talking about any kind of dietary shift, something that is important is microbial diversity. And whether you get there through vegetables or whether you get through through you know, a diverse diet, uh, and if you wanna use a probiotic and adjunct to it, then that's absolutely doable. But it's just something that we do need to be paying attention to. And it's something that I talk about a lot with intermittent fasting or again, any diet change. So there is a link down below for you to save 15% off of your seed purchase. So you just use that code that's down below in the description. And a big thank you to Seed for the continued support on this channel so we can keep doing what we're doing. Yeah, because you don't think about, uh, a lot of times like we get lost in this world, at least I can speak for myself, of body composition, body composition, body composition, but I can speak again for myself that when I perform better, performance, that that sort of precludes, that is like a prerequisite for the body looking better, you know, and it's not, it doesn't have to exist, but if my performance is lacking, it does a lot of cascading things negatively. Self-esteem, things, your eating habits change, and uh, just that catalyst for more assimilation. And like you said, there's a difference between consumption and assimilation of the nutrients. Yeah. You know, and it's, you mentioned sodium, which we're gonna do a separate video discussing sodium in general, but that's one of the biggest pieces of proper refeeding. And you have to think of like a 16-8 even, or an 18-6 intermittent fasting. It may seem negligible, but your body is always trying to find and find that homeostasis of minerals in your blood. Okay, so when you are fasting, even if you're fasting for 16 hours, you're withdrawing minerals out of the cell into the bloodstream to keep blood levels stable because it is so important. So that what happens is when they, people break their fast, if you break your fast with a ton of carbohydrates, well, first of all, that's the first thing that we want to do. So let me say like, you're not incorrect for thinking that that is like the right way to go because from a muscle building standpoint, it's what's been ingrained in our brains since muscle building magazines have been saying, carbs and protein after your workout. So you automatically think that. But when you've been fasting for an extended period of time, when you do have some carbohydrates, it opens up basically the cell doorway, you know, for, because even protein is going to do it to some degree, but protein and carbohydrates, you're spiking insulin, cell doorway opens. Now you've got this uh, 
gradient between sodium and every, all the minerals that have gone into the bloodstream that are not in the cell. So what happens once the cell opens? Well, law of osmolarity, they're going to they're going to rush back into the cell, and then your sodium levels in your bloodstream can drop. Mm -hmm. So how do you get around that? The simplest thing is no matter what the process is, no matter what your end goal is with intermittent fasting, break your fast with protein first. Prioritize the protein. Don't even think of it as a meal. It is at that point, whether you're eating chicken, whether you're eating fish, whether you're eating steak, or whether you're having a protein powder, twist it in your mind that that is a tool, that is a supplement, that is not a meal. That is how you need to cleanly break your fast, and then 30, 60 minutes later, then you can get on to, okay, cram in as many calories as you need to get. Yeah. So many things you covered there. I was just thought, so I should be writing this down because I, a lot of things you discussed. Uh, let me see where my, where my brain heads here. First of all, I talked about having adequate carbohydrates to train with because yeah. it, it may improve performance. Um, uh, Mike Mutzel is a perfect example of somebody who is, who is devoutly keto and intermittent fasting who eats carbs around the training window yeah. uh, just because he notices that, that it increases his performance. You know, he keeps track of the weights that he can lift, the amount of sets and reps he can do, and kind of how he feels. Having said that, the co-author of The Vertical Diet, Dr. Damon McCune, who's a PhD RDN, he was head of the dietetic department at UNLV. I, I partnered with him about three years ago just to make sure that, you know, Mr. Meatneck here wasn't blurting shit out that didn't make sense. To, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I studied a lot of this stuff. My exercise science was back in 1989. And uh, things change. They evolve. And uh, you forget a few things along the way. And he did a, uh, his PhD uh, was on... Um, mouth rinsing before a workout. Hmm. Just a carbohydrate drink, but you don't actually swallow it. Yeah. Provides a stimulating effect for the brain. It seems like a lot of the supposed fatigue that you may experience at the end of a day and you think you're tired, too tired to train, is psychological, not yeah. physical. And so the idea that we need all these carbs to have enough energy to go in to train really has less to do physiologically, hmm. more to do psychologically. That's interesting. Uh, Menno Henselman has recently done a lot of uh, uh, posts about this kind of thing as well. Um, just mouth rinsing with a carbohydrate drink. Just rinse it out and spit wow. it out. If you That's don't want to you know, break a fast or consume too many carbs, if yeah. you're devoutly keto and that works for you. And there's a lot of reasons why keto does work. You know, we've talked about it a lot on your show, the mental clarity that you get from that, the, the decrease in cravings and things like that. I experience the same thing when, when, uh, when I go low carb, yeah. which I don't do too often. Uh, any, anymore uh, because I maintain I'm pretty lean. Yeah. Um, but uh, I've, I've dieted many times for shows with less than 50 grams of carbs. Performance would eventually suffer at a very high end. You could see it in your top yes. list. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe for sets and reps you'd be able to accomplish in a given workout. And that is kind of the underlying factor in how much muscle you can hold on it to. It is, indeed, indeed. It's the performance aspect. Yes. It's not necessarily as adequate protein. Yep. But the, you know, adequate calories, but where carbs and fats fall in there yeah. is a matter of personal preference in so much as you're able to maintain your performance, and many people can. Yeah. When performance starts to decline, when you lift significantly less weight or less volume, uh, we call volume load, sets yeah. times reps times weight, uh, as you go through your diet, You'll, your, your muscles just don't think they need yeah. to be that strong anymore, and, and you may lose some muscle tissue. Again, we're talking about a, a very elite group of competitive athletes. I think it happens in everyone, though. I think it's just maybe just the elite competitive athletes notice it. More. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think, you know, because they're nuancy about tracking things and they're paying attention. Oh, man, I'm not, you know, it's... And I hate to dive off here, but you said something very important. Just getting sufficient protein in a diet is not an adequate stimulus for maintaining lean muscle tissue. You have to lift weights. Yes. You have to. That's very And important. more and more people are starting to scream that from the rooftops. And I know that some people don't enjoy it. And for us, it's like, yeah, because we love <laughs> to lift weights, <laughs> yeah. right? But I'm not asking you to be a bodybuilder or powerlifter. But at least twice a week, yeah. you do have to engage in some resistance training to hold on to muscle yeah. tissue while you're dieting, yeah. while you're losing, hopefully, body fat, yeah. primarily. Yeah. Because if you lose too much muscle, now we're changing your BMI, your yes, basal metabolic changes. rate. Yep. And if you yo-yo, which you're more likely to do when you lose muscle tissue, you're more likely to gain more fat back quicker. That has a pretty dramatic change. That's when metabolic adaptation comes in. Yes. Now you're the same weight as you were a year ago, but you've yo-yoed, but burning fewer calories at rest. 
That's the deficit we want to avoid. You just hit you the nail on the head too. That's less muscle tissue. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. And I know we study muscle tissue as it relates to, to basal metabolic rate and suggest that it's very few calories at rest. But in action, yeah. <laughs> it's significantly more. Yep. And so that muscle tissue might not raise your BMR significantly. What is it, 20 to 80 calories a day? For, yeah, if you're sitting you know, on the couch. If you're sitting on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> but once you start moving, now you're burning, you know, it's exponential. You're going to start burning a lot more calories than you used to. And that's not to suggest that exercise is the most critical component of weight loss. It's not. Yeah. It's the most critical component of weight loss maintenance. Yes, that's a good point. And exercise isn't uh, as important as non-exercise, which we kind of touched on earlier when we talked about people who's who are tired maybe from low thyroid function. Yeah. Low thyroid function has a very small impact, even significantly low, like hypothyroid, clinical hypothyroidism, might only be 30 to 150 calories a wow. day yeah. in terms of your basal metabolic rate. But it makes you tired. And so you're, you sit more. That dictates the rest and of And that non-exercise <laughs> activity thermogenesis is the one. That's the, the area that the most significant that we're in most control over, just staying on your feet, yeah. moving around, uh, just even fidgeting. Yep. You know, you tend to slow down as you diet and you, you just move less. You might even blink slower or fewer times in a day. Totally. It, it, that's the big one. When well, you flip that to muscle building too, it's the same. Like it's <laughs> because like people think that like want to build muscle, so they train and then they sit on their butt, yeah. right? Where it's like keeping that constant stimulus burns calories, but it's also a stimulus. Yeah. yeah. So I know I, I kind of got off of the, the, the path of, of carbohydrates for workouts, um, but I, I thought that was important to address because um, carbohydrates don't necessarily mean energy. Yeah. And as, as a matter of fact, if you eat a lot of carbohydrates in a meal, or even calories in general, but carbs seem to do it more than others, you get that what we call postprandial somnescence, yeah. the, the, yeah. the kind of the tiredness, yep. the fatigue that people experience. And people think that they're tired, uh, or they think they lack energy because they don't have enough carbohydrates. Oftentimes it's because they're dehydrated. And this happens a lot in keto. So one of the things I caution for people who go carnivore or keto, when you lose carbohydrates, you've talked about a lot on your show, you lose glycogen from the muscle, which has three parts water. And that water is not just water, it's salt water. Yep. And so you might end up with getting some fatigue. I think they call it the keto flu. Yep. You can mitigate that by getting sufficient hydration, yeah. not by eating more carbs necessarily if that's not what you choose to do because they're, again, with the, the somnescence or uh, maybe you've got type 2 diabetes, which is very common. You don't want to be eating a lot of carbs with type yeah. 2 diabetes. Uh, maybe it makes you hungry. when It makes you both tired and hungry sooner when yeah. you eat a lot of carbs. So there's a lot of great reasons to reduce carbohydrates other than just the caloric value of them. But you have to mitigate hunger and energy. Those are the two reasons that people fail on diets, yeah. is they get hungry and they get tired. If, if, if you didn't get hungry and you didn't get tired, then you wouldn't have to keep eating other than, yeah. you know, if it were a stress situation or, a, you know, another psychological kind of thing. Uh, and the way to mitigate that, we've just said that, that, you know, you don't have to have the carbs. You can use, uh, get adequate electrolytes. You can use a mouth rinse and yeah. psychological as opposed to physiological. Uh, the, all of those things are, are valid ways to manage hunger and energy. So it's just some information for, so people uh, have tools to use to, yeah. to navigate uh, whether it's a keto or intermittent fast and still get all the benefit from the workout that they yeah. hoped they could get. And you will, the caveat is if you're gonna train twice a day, pretty advisable to get carbohydrates post-workout and sodium yes. yep. because the second workout will be significantly better if you're properly uh, uh, carbed up and uh, watered up and have adequate sodium. In the absence of a second workout, you've got 24 hours. Yeah, you've got a lot of... Your glycogen will replenish yeah. itself with any meal at any time. The protein, I think, is the timing is a little more important. Yeah. Um, the carbs, not so much. Well, and that leads off with a great point too, is because people are probably wondering, okay, well, when is the best time to train if I am fasting? And that's, you mentioned uh, some people doing two-a-days, and that just got my brain going. Some videos I did a while back where 
there's benefits to training at different times of the day, first of all. There's different benefits to training under different uh, you know, fed and non-fed states, right? So when you train in a fasted state, you drive up more what is called AMPK, which you're familiar with, but AMPK is ultimately the energy sensor within the body that understands, okay, well, there is more demand for energy than there is currently present. So it facilitates all kinds of different enzymatic reactions, different mitochondrial responses. So the bottom line is, I'm a fan of training in a deep fasted state simply because I feel good with that and I feel like I get longevity benefit and all this. For building muscle, it's not always the best, but for some people it is because it comes down to performance again. But the other piece is, okay, well, when is an opportune time to train in a fed state? Because I've done videos talking about people that do two-a-days where, okay, it actually provides you with a perfect opportunity to get the best of both worlds. You can have your more metabolically driven workouts that are going to benefit from AMPK being elevated uh, in your fasted state, and then go ahead and break your fast after that workout. And then a few hours later, into the day, whatever it is that you wanna do, then you're in a fed state. Guess what? You get an opportunity to also train in a fed state. So your mitochondria are getting used to using two different kinds of fuels because it's kind of like, um, it's not all the way to the point of if you don't use it, you lose it, but in some ways it is, right? Like the mitochondria will adapt to someone that is doing keto or is fat adapted from lots of fasting and it becomes much more effective at utilizing fats. And believe it or not, people don't like to hear this, but if you do keto for too long, you can become glucose intolerant and you have to rebuild your mitochondria's ability to handle glucose effectively again. So what happens is people like fasting, they like keto, and they go into it, and then they all of a sudden they get this, you know, they want to build some muscle. Well, their bodies have become ruthlessly efficient at using fats for fuel, which, way to go. That's what we're generally after when it comes down to that angle. But then all of a sudden you're like, okay, well, if you were to ask me to go and, you know, squat 405 for reps with carbs in my system, there's a chance you would actually bonk and it would have an adverse effect. So then comes this whole philosophy from a lot of the keto crowd where they'll say, I train better without carbs. No, it's not that you're training better without carbs. You are in the moment, but it's the fact that you haven't given yourself the opportunity to upregulate the mitochondrial machinery to process carbs right. In training twice a day, you give yourself the opportunity to get the best of both worlds, to be legitimately dual fueled. But if you can't train twice a day, because it's not always applicable, I don't typically have time to train twice a day. I would love to, but I will alternate sometimes, right? So I'll go maybe a week of training in a fasted state and then I'll go a few days of training in a fed state. And I just play around with it. You have to be your own experiment. And at the end of the day, you have to find what works for you. Um, if you, you know, switching carbohydrates around in your mouth could be interesting because they're not having a pancreatic response. There could be argument that you'll have a cephalic insulin response, but I think that's highly bio-individual. And uh, that could be an interesting way just to test it out to see if, okay, I'm towards the end of my fast, but I'm gonna do a workout. Screw it. Do Try a mouth it. rinse. Yep. Yeah. Do a mouth rinse to see yeah. if it has an effect. But then, you know, what I would recommend people do in terms of maximum insulin sensitivity is if you can arrange to have like your more fat loss oriented workouts at the end of your fast, then that could work out to your advantage. And one of the things that I've recently started talking about is shifting when you fast instead of skipping breakfast as the conventional way of fasting, for building muscle, skipping dinner actually would work better because you'd skip dinner, you'd get up in the morning, you'd already be deep in a fast, you could train, then you could break your fast with your post-workout meal, and then guess what? You have the entire rest of the day to get your calories in. Yeah, uh, again, a lot of great things came up there. One with, if I were to, to choose which meal to skip, yeah. for a 16-8 or for a, a fast, it would be dinner. Yeah. And there's a, a host of research that's come out about chrononutrition, the timing of meals, and how breakfast has a larger uh, beneficial effect on postprandial glycemia yes, it does, 100%, yeah. than, say, dinner would. You tend to, after eating a large breakfast, um, subsequent meals have a lower spike postprandial yep. glycemia yep. in blood sugar and then of course insulin following so the, the area under the curve for the day for insulin elevation is less if you eat breakfast as opposed yep. to dinner and it, you know it may also be uh that that protein uh you know it kind of depends on when you train yeah uh, could be more beneficial for that anabolic window definitely, in, in, definitely. In, in, 
train in the evening, then you kind of think to yourself, well, how long am I going after? Although that, that training stimulus is 24 hours yeah. for muscle protein synthesis. Which is elevation. awesome, right? It's Never awesome. used to believe that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it, it's a long time. But if you do train in the evening, then you'd kind of wonder, well, you know, what percentage of people would benefit from at least getting that 20 yeah. gram bolus of protein yeah. to satisfy that window? Uh, plus for sleep, seems yeah. that chrononutrition uh, benefits sleep when you skip dinner as opposed to breakfast, yeah. eating sooner rather than later are two big deals. It's multifactorial. I know folks want to look at one thing or the other, but we need three and possibly more things. We need a sufficient training stimulus if you want to continue to, to build muscle tissue. It takes about half the effort to maintain as it does to get. Yeah. And so I'm not pushing everyone to go yeah. in there and kill themselves all the time. It could have adverse effects. You could suffer from compensation. You go in and train too hard, and True. next thing you know, you go True. home and sit more and eat more, yeah. which often happens. You need a sufficient training stimulus. You need adequate calories, uh, and you need adequate protein for the day. Yep. And that needs to be within, it, it would be optimal if it were within that, meta, that window that we talked about, that anabolic window, somewhere within about five hours of the training session. And lastly, if you're going to diet, you are going to need to get sufficient protein to hold on to muscle with the training stimulus. You're going to need sufficient fat yeah. or your hormones are going to crash. Yeah. We see this all the time in the fitness figure yeah, physique, bodybuilding, bodybuilding yep. industry with people crashing and, and they have to obviously start using hormone replacement to, yeah. to mitigate those problems. One of the reasons I've been so vocal uh, as of late about all the damage that the bodybuilding terrible the bikini bad. industry yeah. does is because I've seen it since the late 80s. Yeah. People suffering from you know, anemia, amenorrhea, uh, you know, low calcium, shin splints and stuff, particularly in women. Yeah. Um, you know, biotin deficiencies for skin, hair and nails and then ultimately hypothyroidism and hair falling out. Uh, depression, yep. um, the post-show uh, weight regain, yep. uh, the edema, yep. um, almost to the point of hospitalization. Yeah the swelling of the ankles, yep. et cetera, you know, very unhealthy for the heart and everything. I saw all that a lot in the late 80s and throughout the 90s. And I thought, well, as long as it's confined to this industry, which we're a bunch of wackos, <laughs> and, and comes then social comes social media. media. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you hit it right on the head. Yeah. Then comes social media. Now, every soccer mom out there oh, is yeah. seeing these women in the best shape of their life and has no idea what they're going through to get yep. there and what happens after they get off yep. stage. Yep. And so I'm, I'm more vocal about it now. Yeah. This is not the way to go. This over restriction, this egg whites and tilapia and broccoli diets, uh, you know, you're just wrecking these people's bodies, hormones, physically, everything. And so I've been pretty outspoken about it. So keep sufficient fat in, get adequate calories, get sufficient protein, ideally around the anabolic window. And then carbs really, because you're yeah. in a deficit, are the thing that you can start to draw down on most aggressively without a significant impact yeah. um, as compared to the other, in the absence yeah. of the other two. So it really is the one thing that I adjust. Exactly. In the vertical yeah. diet, when, I, when you come across athletes with high workloads, crossfitters training twice a day, power lifters, strong men, you know, big people that need a, a significant amount of calories, I talk about fueling that weight maintenance and yes. that workload with carbs. Yep. And I have preferences for what type of carbs in terms of digestion and performance, et cetera. But for the vast majority of people, the weight loss, the gen pop, uh, you're mostly fruits and vegetables, lean meats, yep. and the fats associated with those proteins. Yeah. No, it's a good point. And it's, I think people get this mindset that it's very black and white. They have to go on carbs or be off of carbs. And it's like you can use carbs as a stimulus if you don't want to go. Because I know a lot of people that watch my channel might be hesitant to just go back on the carb train, right? And I understand. I mean, someone that was very overweight before, I, I get it, definitely get it. That like, it's, it's uh, you know, you're getting the taste of it again and you're like, what's gonna happen? And that comes, you know, some discipline comes with that and some restraint. And I totally understand that, yes, it can, it can kind of send you back there. So you have to understand that, especially if you're someone that's lost weight and now you're trying to build some muscle. Um, but you don't have to have carbs every day. You don't have to have carbs every time. And a nice thing with intermittent fasting is if you don't want to load up on carbohydrates, you can stack them closer to the beginning of your eating period. And then, you know, 
after that, then start adding the fats in to get your calories. Because you do have to remember that, yeah, carbohydrates are only four calories per gram. So the volume of food that you have to eat to get a significant amount of calories in a small window, it's a lot of food, which we're going to do another video on FODMAP and bloating because I think that's a yeah. very important thing. Because yeah. there's people watching that are probably saying, I, uh, like, I just can't physically eat that much. You know? and so if you are limited to when you can have your carbohydrates, it's like that second meal intermittent fasting is what I would think would be the best time to load up your carbohydrates. And then the next meal in terms of volume of food can be a little bit less. So you can prioritize your protein and add some more fats in and maybe a small amount of carbohydrates, but get your fats in so you're at least able to get your calories in, but you're not necessarily you know, leveraging an insulin spike when you want it. Because if you were to take your fats with that second meal along with a bunch of carbohydrates, Intermittent fasting is one of the unique kind of setups where much like bodybuilding where an insulin spike is not bad if you can control it and manipulate it. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest caveat, right? It's like insulin being elevated. Acutely, it's not a problem. Yes. Chronically, it's chronic. it is a problem. Yep. One of the things I like to focus on, we talk about it later, but is the 10 minute walk for the very reason that when you eat a meal, particularly carbohydrates in a meal, you will have an elevation in, in blood sugars and thereby insulin. Taking a 10 minute walk within 30 minutes of that meal yep. can reduce yeah. that by up to 30%, twice as effective as metformin for wow. preventing or reversing type two diabetes yeah. is activity post meal. Yeah. So I'm pretty specific about the timing because that's the window. Yeah. You know, when, you, when you take those, those glycemia tests, they're always like kind of a two hour window. Um, and so that's one of the, the strategies that we utilize because the muscles will uptake glucose yeah. from the bloodstream in the absence of the need of insulin. And if you can get your body to do some of that work for you, then your yeah. pancreas doesn't have to do that's it. That's a good point. Yeah. And this becomes really important for people with prediabetes or diabetes, type 2 diabetes, yeah. that they use other methods because otherwise they're, they're taking more and more medication. Not that metformin is necessarily bad medication, but insulin certainly could be yeah, definitely. Uh, over time. Uh, and, and maintaining uh, high blood sugars, having a high HA1C or high insulin, uh, you know, in your, your fasted insulin, that's very unhealthy. That's the, un yeah, exactly. Now you start getting the, the metabolic disorders, the fatty liver, uh, the high blood pressure, uh, the damage to the endothelial lining of the yeah. blood vessels, which can precipitate cardiovascular disease. So all those things, that's actually the biggest, um, uh, what would you call it, uh, uh, trying to find the right term that they use, but... Uh, for all cause, well not for all cause, but specifically, well for all cause mortality, high blood sugars is, probably has the biggest effect size yeah. is what name I was yeah. looking for. Uh, you know, you talk about LDLs, very small effect size yeah. uh, in terms of, of management of LDLs. Certainly important, it can be causal uh, for cardiovascular disease, but it's, it's pretty tiny. Yeah in comparison to elevated blood sugar. Yes. So yeah, this is where, you know, controlling carbs and utilizing the methods that we talked about uh, can be efficient, effective, very, very effective. The 10 minute walks, the, you know, reducing carbohydrates, the, uh, we talked about meal timing uh, in terms of skipping dinner as opposed to breakfast and its effect on postprandial glycemia, uh, lifting weights in general, yeah. you know, those kinds of things. And then you find people who, and this is an appeal to authority, people who have been devoutly uh, keto and intermittent fasting, such as Dr. Peter Atiyah, mm -hmm. who most famously for three years pissed on keto sticks and showed everybody the results, yeah. now eats carbs because yeah. he's lifting weights a lot more yeah. now. And he just wants to improve that window. But he still stays Precisely. keto most of the time. He's still able to get a little bit of carbs. We talked about Mike Mutzel doing the same yep. thing. That's what I do. Targeted, targeted keto where you're targeted adding... Targeted keto. Yeah. I just don't want people to be afraid of it. No, and that's, that's, I guess that's, a, that's just this constant battle that I have within even the keto community. I'm, I'm you know, one of the largest keto authorities on YouTube, and sometimes I feel like I upset people by not demonizing carbohydrates. I mean, it's still a very viable fuel source, and it's all about keto is a hormetic stressor. I mean, for all intents and purposes, we are using it to elicit a stress response on the body to trigger adaptation. By no means is that something that should be like, should you elucidate from that, that you should just be doing that and only that. Yeah. Granted, there are use cases, therapeutic, and you think we could kind of go on and on with that. Yeah. And I, I wanted to, before I forget, because this was a very important thing that popped into my head as you were talking about like the 10 minute walks and everything like that. I do think one of the most important strategies for building muscle during an intermittent fasting like regime is during your eating periods 
is to keep moving, is to get those 10 minute walks in. Because if you are cramming carbohydrates and calories into a smaller window, your risk of driving that insulin level high for a prolonged period of time is going to be higher. So you do want to keep moving. And I promise you, you're not going to sacrifice a bunch of muscle by going for a 10 minute walk. If anything, you're going to help it. So just keep that in mind. And, yeah. and also I mean, during your fasting period, people tend to shy away from wanting to do activity because they think they're going to break down muscle. I'm not saying you need to go out and you need to like, you know, push boulders around for, you know, 16 hours, but remember this, it's very important. Your muscles are an organ that is constantly communicating with your brain. Okay. So if you are fasting and you're not eating, okay, and you don't work out, the body is going to start to break down muscle tissue more if you're not working out in a fasting period than if you are because it needs to communicate, hey, remember brain, I am relevant. Muscle needs to constantly shout at the brain, I'm relevant, don't eat me, I'm relevant, don't break me down, I'm relevant. Again, it doesn't mean you need to be schlepping heavy stuff around, but you do need to keep moving. It will preserve the muscle more likely than if you were to say, I'm gonna fast for 16 hours, but it's hard so I'm just gonna sit down and watch Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> And there's some people for whom uh, you don't want to create a nocebo effect. You don't yeah. want to discourage sure. them from incorporating carbohydrates in their diet if that's preferable to them because yeah. the best diet's the one that you'll follow. Yes. And there's many paths to the same destination, whether it's intermittent fasting or keto or a combination of the two or a host of other you know, options. There are you know, a million of them out there. But you want to give people choices and options so that they find the one that works best for them yeah. because long-term weight loss maintenance is the challenge. It's not losing weight. Six out of seven people go on a diet, lose weight. Yeah. It's not hard. You know? yep. uh, I should say it's, it's simple, not easy. Yeah. Yeah. The vast majority of people regain the weight within three years. We see that from the weight control registry, who's the, the largest, um, they've tracked the most successful dieters. Over 10,000 dieters have lost over 60 pounds and kept it off for six years. And, uh, all of them, well, 98% of them went on a diet. Not a specific diet per se, but they had a plan. Yeah. A plan's better than no plan. They said, I was going to lose weight. I'm going to, you know, and, and there should be options so that when you start down this journey of weight loss that you find something that works for you. Yeah. And there's lots of, you know, like when you, when you map quest directions someplace, oftentimes there's three different ways to get there. And yep. you look at how long it takes and whether it's the freeway or it's back roads or whether there's an accident. And yeah. There's a lot of different ways to get there. And I, I try and encourage people to, to let's find the path that works best for you yeah. because that's going to be the best choice for long term. So people who want to try keto uh, or intermittent fasting but think they can't eat carbs but they like carbs, uh, maybe for, specifically for that performance opportunity yeah. if it improves them, you can do both. Yeah. And that would fit that group of people. And so... I'm always cautious not to suggest, uh, I, I've had clients come to me and said that, that certain practitioners, medical doctors, wouldn't help them lose weight unless they did a particular diet. Yeah. And I'm like, well, and, and, and they expressed to me that they tried that and they didn't enjoy it. Yeah. That's a dead end right there. That's, that's the number one thing. So yeah, it's try and accommodate them. Uh, obviously, they need to have some plan, but then you try and use, uh, you know, what works for their schedule. I think 78% of people in the, the weight control registry who lost weight do eat breakfast. Yeah. Whether you do or you don't, yeah. it's a matter of personal preference. Not that one's better than the other necessarily. Totally. It's, that you, you, it's your choice. Yeah. And that's what we would like to do. It's, it's one of the things I like about Mark is he's, he's all over the place. You know, Mark can't keep, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's just all Mark, over Mark the place. Bell, but Mark Bell. Yeah, yeah. But he's tried everything, yeah, and he encourages other people to try everything. You know, one month it's, it's keto, one month it's intermittent fasting, another month it's vertical diet, another month it's paleo. And, and, and everybody's always screaming and yelling about Mark. You know, you've, last month it was this, next month it's that. That's it the may point. very well be, that's yeah. the point. You know, <laughs> until you find something that works. And, and so that's the point. Everything works. Yeah. Nothing works forever. Yeah. Uh, so you may have to to make adjustments ongoing. You may yeah, have to 100%. make some changes and see what you know, long-term benefits you, how you feel. Yeah, no, it's, it's perfect. I, mean, I guess that's why I, mean, I continue to be an advocate for intermittent fasting so much because I feel like you get to leverage the primary benefit that you're trying to leverage from ketosis, which is still fat adaptation. Mm -hmm. But in my eating window, I can experiment with whatever I want. I can combine intermittent fasting. If I want to go vegan for a month, I can do intermittent fasting and vegan. If I want to go paleo, if I want to do carnivore, if I, it doesn't matter because 
the intermittent fasting is just the timing system, which yeah. can be applied to anything. And I know we're running probably up on close to an hour here. Yeah. But we're going to do some more, more content together, but Stan, it's yeah. Thank awesome. you. It was and a good talk. Can, where can everyone find you in your book? Uh, StanEfforting.com. It's all in there. My meal prep company is in there. The Vertical Diet delivers nationwide. And I've got uh, content under Stan Efforting on Instagram, content under Stan Efforting on YouTube. So everything's there. The Vertical Diet. Yeah, this, this book is Really Thank powerful. you. We've worked hard on it. And, yeah. and again, Damon McCune, PhD, RDN. This is uh, over 200 pages with over 500 scientific references yeah, to peer reviewed no, published awesome. research. So I have an ebook that's a lot of the same information, but the ebook allowed me to put links. Uh, so when I talk about certain items, I reference. Uh, people who are kind of known authorities in that area, yeah, nice. and I link their articles and their videos. Oh, sweet. If people want to take cool. a deeper dive, so that's kind of one of the advantages. And then I update it periodically, which of course you can't do with a, a book necessarily. Yeah. But they're both you can come to their house and edit it. Yeah, this is on Amazon and in uh, Barnes and Noble. So cool. Thank you. Perfect. Awesome. Well, as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I will see you all tomorrow.